Commission. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, and um, good morning, members of the Commission. I am waiting for the screen to pull up, but I do have, I believe everyone can see the slides that are on the uh, webinar meeting at this time. Again, my name is Lynn McCor. I'm the consultant for school psychology. I'm also a licensed school psychologist practicing in the state for almost 20 years. And I am going to um, try to uh, just provide some contextual um, information around our, our why, our what, and our how regarding the national credentialing for school psychologists and recognition in the state of North Carolina. Okay, um, it's not a thing. So, as um, as you all probably know, um, the training requirements and our training programs are on this first slide that you're seeing. Our programs in the state, we have five, and actually they're great training programs. They are all approved by our National Association of School Psychologists, which means that they, which means that they meet the highest threshold of training um, for uh, school psychologists in the country. And it's a real easy um, slide in for any school psychologist going through those training programs to obtain their license in our state. You can see on the right hand side of the slide our licensure requirements, our um, completion of a, an approved program at the sixth year level, and the attaining score of 147 on the Praxis in School Psychology, and then of course um, our license that's actually issued through the State Board of Education as the licensing authority. Um, and so just, I just want to kind of clarify some of the optics around school psychology when we're talking about it because it is um, sometimes in my conversations with many folks across the state, especially school level um, leadership, that there is, um, and I, I'm sorry, there were some additional slides that I added um, that don't, didn't show up in this. In, in this part of the presentation, but the um, our practice here in this state is guided by uh, the professional um, standards and our practice model, as well as our general statute and our state board of ed policy. So when we are when we are looking at what feeds into our practice standards, we see that these three feeders in the state of North Carolina are what we, we, come, we come out with in terms of our professional practice. And what complicates things are district level expectations and the things that surround our workforce reality. This is my version, right? I have to go this one. Um, and just to, again, give this context of what slice, one slice of um, psychological services looks like in our state, the, um, the assessment slice of services is what many people um, conclude are completely associated with the school psychological service delivery model. And just to give you some data on what the assessment service piece looks like, based on some data that we had from 2016-17, there were about 740 psychologist practitioners that were providing the direct services across our schools in the state. And when we look at our initial referral data and um, our reeval data and our pre-K data, we can see that um, there were about 30,000 initial referrals that flowed through a school psychologist practitioner as far as um, fulfilling the requirement of at least a psychological evaluation and the report writing slice of the initial referrals. We do not have really good streamlined data to connect the dots on psychologists and pre-K pre evaluations and the re-evals that they were involved with, but we can expect that there were a large number of those as well. So when we see that we have an imbalance of our practitioners, and the assessments um, that are required of psychologists, it often leads to a false narrative around the assessment service practice model only. And uh, just stating that assessments, um, some facts about assessments, they're very important. When we do them of quality, they support good instructional decisions, and we should be doing them. 
but they are part but not all of the skill set. So just trying to position us within the different types of practice models that exist and get us to the why in North Carolina our practice model needs to be given some attention. Um, the assessment-based practice model on this slide, you can see that the student access to this type of practice is um, typically our students who are in special ed programs or are referred for special ed programs. And um, the majority of time in that model is spent conducting evaluations. This may be, for those of you who have ever engaged with the school psychologist, the many school systems across our state, this is their level of engagement with the service delivery that many school psychologists are facing due to our numbers. Um, the comprehensive service delivery model is where students have equitable access, if needed, to the services that the school psychologist provides. What that, what that translates to is, um, when we, are, when we don't have equitable access for all of our students, we have, what, 1,552,638 students um, as of last year's data across our state. It doesn't mean that a school psychologist is going to see every one of those students, but the practice model that we are to adhere to suggests that, we, that students should have equitable access if needed to those services. What ends up being on the assessment-based model is numbers-wise about 300,000 students. That is our most recent child count data um, in the state. We have about 300,000 students with IEPs across our state, and unfortunately, due to our numbers, our service delivery is limited to a very small subset of our student population. And so the training and background, just to situate our um, thinking, is um, should be around what the what school psychologists are trained in, which is of course learning behavior, mental health, and the systems level work. And it's really important to distinguish the difference between systems level and student level services because they are heavily trained in the big picture systems level. And so it's not just that um, school psychologists should be seeing every student, but they should also be accessible within their system to help with um, database problem solving establishing systems of evidence-based programs and interventions and being able to evaluate the delivery of services across the majority of the students in the in the building so there's a lot of systems level work that student uh, school sites are trained in and then there's of course the student level services and as i referenced earlier the unfortunate circumstance that we're in in our state is that most of the student level services are surrounding referrals and evaluations but our practice model laid out in this slide shows the 10 domains of practice that school psychologists are trained in and they are um, the domains that our five training programs in the state operate around within their delivery of their training, and it's, they're also the domains of training that are encompassed in the national credential training programs. And then when we look at our state standards that were approved by the State Board of Education in 2009, we're nine years in to the change in the standards, um, the requirement is that all students have equitable access to these services. So that has been the charge that was approved since October 2009, that school psychological services be accessible to any student within any system that needs them. And we still have a very long way to go to get there. These are our data that helps to establish, I know that there's been a lot of communication with our state association to members of this commission. So I'm just giving you the data points here very quickly of what our numbers um, look like as of last year's data, that we had 782 and a quarter um, employed full time in our state, that's to uh, that 1,552,638 students. Wait, 30, almost 39 of those positions were not direct service delivery positions, they were director type positions or coordinator of school psychological services. So they were not actually servicing students um, directly, they were, those positions are created to help establish the systems level work. And so when we adjust the total, we really had about 743.4 school psychologists that were actually working directly with students, which leaves our ratio at that one um, school psychologist to um, almost 2,100. And that's what it looks like in comparison to the national model. The national model recommends, based on those national standards of practice, um, and which translate down into our state standards that were approved by the Board of Ed nine years ago, 
Um, that one to 700 ratio is what is recommended in order to be able to deliver and provide equitable access to those services. Where we're at this um, as of last year, and it's been hanging around us for the past four years that I've been tracking the data in this position, um, it is three times that recommended ratio. So that helps to establish the why, and there is still um, you know, some additional data that shows how I've mapped out by regional distribution what our school psychologist um, workforce looks like based on the eight education districts laid out by the State Board of Ed. And you can see that they're pretty much hanging around. We have some areas of the state that the average is a little bit lower than that one to 2100, but then um, the majority of uh, regions across the state have that way above the one to 700 ratio. I also have a slide in here that just illustrates um, those districts that have less than one full-time equivalent of school psychologists employed within their district. So that's laid out. We had last year 13 districts that did not employ school psychologists. And then we had many that were very, um, they were partially employed or they were contracted positions. So they're all listed by region on the slide that um, you have before you right now. So just some additional data points to consider when we're looking at the context of service delivery and the problems like that we, we really face in the state around our service delivery. And these were the vacancies that were reported to me last year. Um, we had about 75 vacancies and that was that's not accounting for capacity building but just gaps that existed in their um, existing positions across the state and the distribution of that by region so what we work to try to accomplish is addressing this as a multifaceted complex issue that is not going to change overnight um, and one of the things that we have identified um, is, you know, first we need to look at closing the employment gap. So really filling the holes that exist in our state. As of what I knew last year, there were 75 holes. Um, so we needed to, we need to like, you know, stop that and then, then look at building capacity. The, the ways to do that, we've identified um, like really looking at um, increasing student enrollment in our existing class training programs. Our institutes of higher education and I work very well together. Um, we're very collaborative and very we communicate openly. And they have I've been tracking their data and they have been doing a stellar job in getting their cohort sizes um, filled with quality individuals, not sacrificing quality for quantity. But I have what I have seen over the past two years the cohorts increase, so we will be hopefully producing more. What we want to do is place those interns in within the fir their last year of study is a pretty much a 1,200 hour internship placement as like practicing as a intern in the, in the public school system. We want them in our state. We want those interns to be placed in our state and not go out of state for their internships. So we're working on um, helping to secure those, and I know our local districts are offering stipends and things like that to be able to support that. So we have been working towards those two ends. The other, um, the other issue is that out-of-state recruitment effort that we really need to address because our five, um, our five training programs are necessary but not sufficient to close the employment gaps. And then you could see some other strategies that we need to address overall in the big picture to improve the staffing ratio over time. But I'll focus on the recruitment efforts because that's what this credential is really about. Our, like I said, our training programs are necessary but not sufficient. I have been and we have been watching and um, we have about four states in our country that are producing a surplus of school psychologists that cannot find jobs. There's not enough jobs for how many um, school psychologists they're producing. So we really want to set our eyes on those states as well as others, but those four states have a lot of training programs and we often do get um, applicants from those states. What they run into is sometimes challenges in the nuances that exist between the training programs and the licensure. So, what was created by our national association was this credentialing system, the certification system to recognize the highest standard for credentialing of school psychologists across the country because our national association of school psychologists back in 1989 recognized that there's a need that um, 
that we we understand that school psychologists who meet national standards, um, we need to be able to recognize them in a way that is consistently applied across the country because there is a wide range of credentialing requirements that exist from state to state. The goals of this system that our National Association established are up there, and, and those are some of the goals that they've established. And one of them was to create a uniform credentialing standard, um, set of standards across states, and then to be able to help facilitate easy, streamlined processes for school psychologists to help um, with in areas where the pipeline is a problem, as well as some of the other goals that you see up there. Excuse me. <clears throat> so when we compare our North Carolina training requirements to the, nor uh, the nationally certified school psych credential, you can see that they are a one-to-one -one match in training and they're a one-to-one -one match in testing. Um, the, our state has a very high minimum standard for training of school psychologists, as you can see, and as evidenced by the five training programs in our state, that they're all approved by our national association. And so, so this national credential is really exists um, as a one-to-one -one match for uh, you know what we require here in the state of North Carolina. And this is just some of the information from the infographic. And uh, you know we have about twenty-five thousand school psychologists across the country, based on our national estimates over the past year. And about sixty percent of those actually hold a national, um, the, the credential for it to be nationally certified. There's some more um, kind of like tidbits of information and, and as part of their infographic. I'm not sure if this was ever shared, but I figured I'd just put it in some slides because this is what our national association kind of underscores as, um, you know, the selling points for this national credential. And the one thing that we're here talking about today is, you know, that we're not in any pioneering effort on this, that the majority of states at this point in our country have recognized the national credential as a pathway to state level certification. There's 32 states across the country that have already recognized this and um, help, help to um, license their applicants in this way. And you can see up there on this next slide that we have, um, of those 32 states, we have competition right around us. We have Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia that are included in those 32 states, so they already recognize the credential, and we are at a competitive disadvantage when we um, don't have that yet in place. And what happens is that when, a stu when a, um, someone from outside of our state is looking in through the national network, there's a tab that you can go to to pull up the 32 states. And applicants from out of state who hold this national credential will often go to that tab, they'll see those states, and then they'll set their eyes on those states and it immediately wipes out North Carolina in their job searches. And what's interesting is that those states that are training a surplus, they don't recognize the national credential and probably because they don't really need to. Like they're training a surplus and so they don't really, they don't have recognition of it. Pennsylvania, Texas, um, California, New York. And it's because I would hypothesize that they're training a surplus so they're not at a loss for seeking applicants like some of our other states are including North Carolina. And so the recruitment opportunities that truly exist with this is to um, be able to access, I have access to national networks where I market <laughs> our workforce and our beautiful state from the East Coast to the West um, in the mountains and really um, illustrate kind of uh, job openings that exist across the state so any applicant can look at our state and determine do I want to be in the mountains, do I want to be on the coast, do I want to be somewhere in between in a more um, metropolitan area and they can see what job openings exist and I typically blast that out across the national networks to really try and market the recruitment efforts um, that we need to establish in this state so that's a real easy win to be able to do that and the other um, the other pieces is uh, you know that our frequently accessed websites that I like I just referenced our national website that most job seekers go to to look at what's out there and how states credential they can quickly add us to that list and that will put us in a more prioritized list 
of considerations for anybody outside of North Carolina looking in to consider a move, which there are many from those four states, mostly from New York and Pennsylvania is where I hear a lot of our applicants coming from, but we do have some from California and Texas as well. So just to lay out um, how there could be some real um, targeted communication efforts to those states training a surplus, and you could see um, the, National, uh, the National Association keeps a registry of each state's um, total number of nationally credentialed school sites, and those are, those are the numbers um, in each of those states that hold the national credential that we would want to look to and recruit with this effort. And then I just linked some slides, um, some, some resources at the end of this presentation, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions may have come up to underscore the how. Dr. Miller, this is Glenda Jones. I just have a couple questions and a few comments. Is it now the time for that? Uh, sure. Um, Lynn, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I appreciate all that information. Do you have any idea, or maybe Tom, I think you're on the line, do you have any idea how many um, applicants or applications we have for licensure this year for school psychologists? I do not have those data. Um, I do believe they were there were some data presented at the State Board of Ed meeting that might be in the agenda. Um, on current licenses, I do not know. Dr. Evans, did you want to speak to that? So, uh, Glenda, I'll be talking about this next, but um, the licensure exam data. So from July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018, NCDPI issued 78 school psychologist licenses. Okay. Any idea how many are in the queue right now to be processed? I, I do not. Zero. Okay. Uh, this is Tom Tomberg. Yes. Yeah. There are currently no pending, uh, I'm sorry, this is Tom Chamberlain. There are currently, as of earlier this week, Monday, there were no pending school psychologist licenses in the, in the system. Do you know how many teachers are pending in the system right now across the state? Uh, that's a harder number to come up with. I know the, um, the current pending licenses is somewhere north of 10,000, but not all those would be pending employment in North Carolina. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So on behalf of what I, I really want to say is on behalf of the HR administrators across the state, we totally support the revision that will allow districts to hire school psychologists using the national certified school psych psychologists uh, credential and we support that it be a continuing license that's issued because that's exactly what we do with our six pathologists. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I don't think I've heard mentioned here which was brought up at our last PEPSIC meeting and I think what went to the state board was that there was another provision added to um, LIC and 001 outside of uh, that credential, which would be how quickly those licenses get issued to those two school psychologists. And I just did a quick survey this morning, and out of 14 districts that we had an opportunity to respond, because we we're a lot of closed because of weather, and five of those being the top 10 in size in the state of North Carolina, there are two districts. Glenda? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yes. But you'll need okay, to repeat yourself. What, what was the last thing you heard? Of the... you surveyed some folks from the, and five were from big districts? That's right. I'm sorry. Five were from the top 10 districts in size that have an opportunity to report. I've only had 14 reports this, this morning because I've sent it out early. But out of that, there are 268 teacher vacancies in the state of North Carolina. Okay. Eight, eight of those are in one district, 75 are in another. There are 51 EC teacher vacancies right now, 60 counselor vacancies, nine social worker, eight speech, 
we have 14 psychology uh, psychologist agencies, but with that, with the HR folks I'm talking to, it's more, it's not the length of time it's taking them to get their license process that's the issue. Uh, one, it may be, as Lynn said, the fact that the national credentials not used. That may be part of the reason we're not getting more to come to the state. But outside of that, our biggest um, drawback is in pay. Uh, school psychologists can contract with our district and make more money than they can being placed on the uh, North Carolina state salary schedule. And um, so, so having just, you know, when we look at facts and numbers, you know, when we're looking to maybe shortages, we have to consider shortages across uh, our education spectrum and not just one category of employee. Uh, so I really wanted to just say that this morning and say we totally support what Lynn put out here with the credential and we support that it um, be issued as a continuing license as well. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I just want to underscore that you really illustrated the point well around how this is a multifaceted issue that does impact many disciplines, and this is one seemingly easy um, thing that can be done to help, but it's only one piece of what is going to need to be done to address the issues that exist, and it is across educators, but this is very specific to um, one particular discipline, of course. Thank you very much. Is now the time for I, I have a question, if you don't mind. This is Patrick Miller, and I'm trying to understand um, the, the reciprocity piece, or if there is reciprocity with North Carolina and the National School Psychologist Association. So it, is this correct or not correct? If a North Carolina school psychologist who is holds a, a a clear North Carolina license, a, a full continuing license, by virtue of passing the, the test that we're we're talking about in this issue, does does the National School Psychologist Association honor that testing requirement by granting the the national certification? Mm. Yeah, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, I think um, the, there's a twofold piece to the national credential, and that is the training requirement, just like it is in our state. So the training requirement is not always um, six year level, 60 plus credit hours in our training programs range all the way up to, I think Western has like 73 credit hours required for their training program. So the minimum is, uh, you know, the, the sixth year, but that's one piece of it. So no, there isn't, there isn't that type of reciprocity. You have to get to the national credential by completing the training program and attaining the 147. Now, I will say that our five training programs in this state are all NASP approved, and the process for that national credentialing is much easier if you are a NASP approved program. If you are not, there is, what I would assimilate with kind of the national board certification for teachers process. If you're not coming out of a NASP approved program to attain your national credential, you have to go through a very extensive kind of portfolio review process. Um, even it, you first you have to meet the training requirement and the practice standard, but they do a very extensive like four month process um, review of any of those applicants. So now it doesn't go both ways. But our, tra our training programs produce a very easy, streamlined process to the national credential because they're all approved by the National Association. Thank you. Is okay? So, uh, Dr. Miller. Is, I'm sorry. Linda, this is Linda Jones again. I, I, I think you mentioned this, but I want to make sure I'm clear. Those states that are producing the surplus, mm -hmm. do, those, do those states accept the national credential? They have not. No. Nope. And, you know, I, I think I referenced my hypothesis around that is they don't really need to do anything much sure. because they're, they're training so many school psychologists, most of them can't find jobs um, up in those states, so they end up defaulting to other states because they have such a high level of training program. So, no, none of those four 
have the national credential recognized. Okay. They're in the, what is it, um, eight, 18 we states. We do support HR folks that, that we do that in North Carolina. I mm -hmm. think that's something that maybe the organization at the state level of your group could really try to work with these other states because yes. it would be good if nationally that was recognized so that these folks are not having those issues from state to state. Yeah, and we are um, definitely established working with the state association here. I work closely with them and really looking at those four states in targeted recruitment efforts. But we also want to um, get to our neighbors who have recognized the national credential and say, hey, North Carolina is doing this now too, and it should be more streamlined for you, like Virginia, Georgia, and South Carolina have already done. Dr. Miller, this is uh, Michael Marr. I, I want to make a couple of comments. So, I think, I think for the for, for the last year at least, we within the commission have had a lot of conversations about reducing barriers for qualified individuals to come into the state and, and be employed, whether it's teachers or counselors or, or uh, other school professionals. And I think this is in line with with what we've with what we've tried to do for the last year. Um, with regard to these uh, school psychologists in particular, so I agree with with uh, Glenda that you know we ought to be recognizing the national credential with a continuing That's license. I think that we perhaps had erred in where we put the uh, language last month. So so last month we approved uh, some new language, the nationally certified school psychologist credential issued by the National Association of School Psychologists will be accepted to the extent that such certification remains aligned with the licensure requirements for the state of North Carolina. Should the requirements change for NCSP certification, NCDPI will reevaluate, determine whether the revised NCSP will continue to be used as an eligibility requirement for the provisional license. It's on page 11 uh, of LICN 001. What I would suggest is one, it should not read provisional license. We don't, we're not going to issue a provisional license to someone who's fully met requirements. We would issue a continuing license, not a provisional. So that, continuing license. Yes. Right. So this, number one, this is not in the right place. I would suggest it needs to be moved to page six of LICN 001. Under there, you'll see number six, student services. That's where these folks fall. Um, I would also recommend that we uh, the, the line on page six reads, school psychology will, re will be restricted to the sixth year and doctorate levels and school social work may be under the bachelor's level. I would suggest that the next sentence ought to be that previous sentence that I just read with the change from provisional license to continuing license and then the next sentence, school language pathology, be separated from that paragraph. So that begins a new kind of section or paragraph. And I think that would kind of fix what what the issue seems to be, uh, and I think I'm also recommending that we, we strike the 30-day issue as that's really um, procedural in DPI, and it's not really our, mm -hmm. within the licensure section, it's, it's, I don't necessarily think it's our business to tell the licensure section how to process licenses. Mm -hmm. So All that's right. it for me. Thank you. Before we get into that discussion, uh, Dr. Evans has a presentation to make on the feedback that was received from the state board on this issue and I think that some of the uh, feedback may inform our discussion so if, it, if there are no further questions for uh, Ms. McCoy and I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. That is totally fine. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, we'll move into Dr. Evans' presentation and thank you Ms. McCoy for, for sharing that with us. Thank you for the opportunity. So what I'm going to present on is what Dr. Cyber talked about during the state board and comments and conclusions from that conversation. Dr. Cyber talked about the history of how we Pep Pepsi came to talk about national certification for school psychologists and he reviewed that at the July meeting the state board requested that this be a topic of discussion at Pepsi um, to help recognize to recognize the national certification for school psychologists and also consider other school service 
individuals in the mix. Um, as well as expediting the provisional licensing process for these uh, areas. From there, Pepsi has reviewed that last month and then um, we brought it back to the state board. We brought it to the state board last Thursday on October 3rd and presented it to them there for review and after, after seeing this presentation and hearing the data that I'm about to share with you, it's been recommended by the state board that it be brought back to Pepsi. So this is, will be the second time for Pepsi to be able to see this and the final time for it to be talked about. Um, Dr. Cyberwork also made it clear that this was not reciprocity, that if the exam did change or any of the qualifications did change for the national certification, then North Carolina was able to re-examine that process. And then he went over the policy language that was in, in place that Dr. Marr talked about in the provisional licensing section with the 30-day turnaround time and that what I just talked about the credential being accepted for the provisional licensing as well as if the requirements change for the certification then NCDPI would be able to reevaluate whether that would be accepted or not and then he reviewed what happened during the September Pepsi meeting and how the Pepsi during that Pepsi does not belong <laughs> during the September Pepsi meeting um, it was approved to recommend it to the board however there were concerns raised about the 30-day turnaround time for a school psychologist to receive their license because it would have priority over teachers and it opens the door for other demands on licensure and these the remaining slides are the data that the state board wants to make sure that Pepsi members see because this is not this is what was not available to Pepsi members at the last Pepsi meeting. So the first slide talks about from the time an application is submitted it takes 30 to 45 days to issue any license and that was reported by NCDPI licensure department on 9-27-2018. The next slide talks about the number of psychology school psychology licenses within the past three years. So from July 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2016, um, NCDPI issued 69 of them. From July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2017, NCDPI issued 81 licenses and from July 1st, 2017 to July to June 30th, 2018, NCDPI issued 78 school psychologist licenses. And then the last slide talks about um, how many licenses overall there are that NCDPI, NCDPI issues. So from July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2017, NCDPI issued 103, 349 licenses. And from July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018, NCDPI issued 100,460 licenses. And the school psychologist licenses represent 0.08% of all licenses issued by the state. So that's the data that the state board wanted to make sure all Pepsi members were aware of before making any type of recommendation. Are there any questions? Hey Kim, this is Ann Bullock. I have a question. Thank you for that. That was really, really helpful. Um, sure. I'm very supportive of having this as an option for school psychologists and I'm sure as Glenda said, the HR folks are that I'm sure that I, I my IAG colleagues agree with me. But I have a question about licensure 
um, policy 001 on page 7. On page 7, it talks about, this is following up with what Michael was talking about, but just a different part. It talks about, in the third paragraph, it talks about the student services personnel who are licensed in another state or have three or more years of student license, student services school experience and have not passed the required test can basically um, complete the national board certification to be granted a continuing professional license. So my question is, <coughs> is this already in policy in 001, what we're trying to talk about today, which most of us are supportive of and is it just unclear and in the wrong place and is it more procedural to change it around like michael was talking about versus adopting a new component yeah and they can't they can't actually get the national credential unless they've passed the test the test is a requirement of the national credential for school psychologists but my point is we're saying that the national credential the national certification is an option here is it not an option? Is that not what this is saying? It, it is an option because it fulfills those requirements. If it didn't fulfill those requirements, it would not be an option. Does that answer your question? So, so to your point, this is Glenda. I, what I think I hear everybody saying here is that psychologists are still going to have the option of either taking the North Carolina test or having their national credential right we're not removing that option we're just saying if you have the national credential you don't have to take the test which may again goes back to making this no, sound like it no, really is all no, you, procedural you, no right? you, you have to have the test legislation basically says long as they can require much that have been defined by the state <clears throat> no. it doesn't you know, it doesn't specify which test in legislation. But it sounds procedural. This is uh, Wesley Wood speaking. And uh, just looking at that paragraph, I think the issue is the three or more years piece. Um, that that's Therefore, it's not truly already in place because they have to be out of state and have three or more years experience. So I think that's the part we need to, to eliminate there. Right. And I, I am, this is Anne again, Anne like I'm, I am fine with changing this language to make it more fluid to what we're trying to do. But my, I guess my question is, do we need a new policy or do we just need to procedurally change what's in policy? Dr. Tomlin, are you out there? Uh, can you speak to these questions and, and the rulemaking <laughs> process and some of the issues related to that? Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that I've talked with both the state board and this commission about is the need for a comprehensive um, licensure policy revisions. Um, and the reason that is so important is um, North Carolina has recently de determined that the, the Supreme Court has recently determined that DPI is subject to state rulemaking processes. Therefore, every rule we make and licensure would be conclu included under this has to be put before the state's rule making commission that is a particularly onerous process um, and can take a long time to make changes so basically is going into administrative code um, as opposed to just being state board of education policy for that reason it is in, it's really important that we that we revise the licensure code at a very high level so that we know what we're putting into that. And once we go through that process, we know that it's the way we pretty much want it. Procedural issues should be put into a licensure manual, which the state is currently working on, where we can operationalize the policies to make it clear to everyone what would be, what would, when we say that you have to, you know, you have to pass these tests or meet these requirements, what are the other options that we would accept as evidence of meeting those requirements? That kind of stuff, to me, should be placed in a procedure or a policy manual that can have some flexibility to be changed with the state board and with the, with the commission, rather than being placed into administrative code where we would not have those, we would not have easy options to, to change it should the need arise. 
This is this is Andrew. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, can, can I throw out one one point, Dr. Miller? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I just 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 in terms you had mentioned it could take a long time. So for the past uh, almost year now, Pepsi has been making recommendations to the board. The board has been uh, recommending or sending back this process. Basically, is a, a, essentially a, a two-step process. The recommendation goes to the board. The board thinks about it, and then the following month approves it, or in some cases even fast tracks it. So. Uh, 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 an idea that comes uh, that germinates from the Pepsi group could take two to three months in order to convert into an actionable uh, policy. Could you share with the with the commission here how long ballpark this this additional layer of rules would would cause this process? So we know that the current process is relatively nimble; it takes a couple months to do that. With this new new policy or this new law in place. We know how long it's going to take uh, for the, the rulemaking body. Is it, is it another month? Is it six months? Is it a year? Do we know any of that? Is that for Tom? Yeah. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. That, that, I, I just realized he was asking me. I don't know. I have not been through this process. But the, um, this, the, the communication that I've received from the state board attorneys is that we need to review licensure policy and make sure it is exactly the way we want it because to change it will take they said about a year so i you know like like i mean i'm fully supportive of the hr directors on this that and everybody else at the table that we need a, a expedited pathway to licensure for these folks um, to address the, the other issue that uh, Dr. Marr raised, this is in the wrong place because the, originally the policy was to was to use the national license as a substitute for the licensure exam, period. Um, it was never presented to us as a substitute for the conditions of a continuing license, which we, we after reviewing it, we agree that the continuing license is exactly the way to go on this. Um, the question becomes, do we want to put that language in administrative code where we could not possibly change it within the school year that it would affect um, should the national license become, you know, separate from the, the North Carolina um, requirements for holding the license. Whereas if we put this in procedure in a policy manual, then we would go through our normal procedures to change that policy ban. Um, this is Ann Bullock again. So I, I completely agree because I completely agree that we want this in action sooner than later. And we want this in a, we don't want a small item like this in licensure, which is causing a big issue to become cumbersome, right? So what, it, what would be your recommendation for this commission today in order to move this action forward immediately around this national certification test for school psychologists? Well, right. I, I mean, I can't say that. I'm sorry, Dr. Bullock, was that question for, for, for me, Tom Domerle? It's either for you or, or Andrew or for Kim, because it sounds <laughs> like if we put, so if we put it in a procedural manual, do we need to vote to do that? I, I guess it's my, I'm talking about logistics here right now. Like, what do we need to do to move this forward? And that might be for you or Andrew or for Kim. So, Dr. So, Bullock, this is Linda again. Can I ask a question before one of them a answers that? Is there any way that we can do exactly what we do for speech pathology? Um, I think that's page 12, I'm not sure, but in the box there, basically it just says provisional licenses are no longer issued in this area however individuals holding non-provisional a-level license must complete the requirements for the m license by whatever condense and just put something and then any other reference to the licensure piece of that would be over in whatever procedural manual or that or licensure manual that DPI has. And that may be simplifying it way too much, Tom, but 
I, I'm not sure why we couldn't do something like that because of high level. Mr. Snyder's here from legal and he'd like to say something. Sure, and this, uh, uh, thank you, Kim. Um, Linda, I'm not gonna address your, your specific question there, but um, I, I, I'd like for us to be careful about this rulemaking overlay, which is going to complicate matters for um, this committee, but will ultimately lead to greater certainty for folks in the field about what licensure uh, means. Now, the benefit of putting something in the administrative code is um, uh, it raises, um, it raises that policy to a level of uh, status of law, which of course is very important with, uh, with rights that surround licensures and the ability to, to practice in any of, these, um, uh, any of these particular professions in our schools. From a legal perspective, we really like having those rules uh, straightforward and uh, in, in uh, the administrative code so that we can defend um, of the consistent actions with respect to uh, granting and revoking licenses. With respect to this issue right now, um, one could, uh, should the Pepsi Commission choose to endorse uh, the proposal that Dr. Marsh put on the table, um, that can go into LICN001 uh, as a recommendation that the board could approve and it would essentially have the effect of a, a policy that would guide uh, folks in the field, it would be an important message to um, the programs that, that train, educate, and certify uh, school psychologists. What it wouldn't do is have the same force of law should there be any challenge with respect to the granting or revocation of a, a, a particular license for these kinds of professionals. So all this to say we're, we're dipping our toes into this question about rulemaking and the effects of those the effects of that process, which, as others have indicated, can be up to a year. Um, but the reasons that we really like to put things in the administrative code is to have the firmest of possible ground uh, to, to defend and justify uh, the granting and revocation of licenses. But Eric, can, this is Patrick. Can I ask you a question? Please. If we were, as a commission, to strike the language around the 30-day uh, licensure piece, the language that's left with the granting of the license for those out-of-state psychologists who hold this passing score on this national exam, in your legal opinion as counsel for state board, does that belong more appropriately in policy or in the licensure procedure manual? Well, you know, I don't know if that's so much a legal question or a, a, a decision for the commission, so I don't want to put my thumbs on the scale on this. I think it certainly would be appropriate <laughs> to put in the policy. Uh, one could add it into LICN001, um, and I don't think that would be problematic. And, in, gotcha. and, and for some reasons it may be you know, straying from my legal lane here, there may be some very good uh, policy re reasons to do that and, and um, message reasons to, to go ahead and update the policy uh, with the revisions that have been suggested. So Patrick, are we ready for a motion? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm the group have any more uh, questions or comments? This is Freebird McKinney. I just say, I want to say from a kind of a teacher perspective of, of just how important kind of on the ground this is and, and as those statistics revealed kind of the, the imbalance between the number of practitioners we have and the number of students that we serve to really address their individual needs. So um, I, I'm, I think uh, from a teacher perspective, we would also be fully in support of, of moving this along so that our students can get that uh, those extra uh, service staff that they require as well. So thank you. And this is Michael again. I, I just want to uh, kind of restate. I, I do think I understand that it could take us could take some time to have this go through rules making or, or whatever the process may be. But I think we need to do the right thing rather than the expedient thing. And so for me, I'm still in favor of having this actually put into LICN 001 in the way that we want it 
regardless of how long that might take. Um, and I don't think, and I could be, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that if it's going through rules making that, that that's going to have a negative impact on anyone who applies during that interim period. They're still going to get treated the same way they are currently being treated. Um, and then I think there's also just a little bit of a misconception. Folks who hold this national credential, based on what I've read, it's not, it's not that they have only taken a test. They've actually completed an approved program in another state that actually matches the approved programs that we have in this state. So, so essentially they've done an equivalent program, which includes coursework, an appropriate internship. They have also completed the licensing exam in order to have that credential, which is what they would have, would have had to do in North Carolina at one of our five, I believe it's five approved right. programs. Um, so that's, that's it for me. Dr. Miller, this is Tom Tomlin. May I speak, say something to that? Sure. So uh, just so everyone's clear, when we presented this to the licensure staff, um, they agreed that it meets, that the national certification meets all the requirements of a North Carolina license. And they have agreed from, from the, the day that this was brought up as being, as satisfying those requirements, that they will use the national board certification, I mean the national school psychologist certification to clear a, a continuing license for an applicant. So this is, this process is happening now, irrespective of what anyone decides whether it belongs in policy or procedure. It is, it is the practice now of NCDPI. This is Anne Thank you, Tom, for that. So if this is already happening, I, and I agree with this happening, so my question goes back to, do we want to send things, I guess my new question is, do we want to send things in chunks forward with 001 or do we want to wait until we have completely redone 001 and include this as part of the revision in the in the near future as we look at licensure as a whole because we all know that there are other things in 001 that need to be done on this creative level like this is a great creative option for school psychologists there should be some extra creative options of equivalency competency based equivalency for other areas and, and this is linda jones and i chair the licensure subcommittee and we we have looked at licn 001 and um you know it's our intent after the um state hr conference next week so that we can get some input on what the committee's worked on to be able to work with Andrew and Tom to bring that to PEPSIC. Um, so, I mean, just kind of FYI, we've already got some creative solutions in mind for other areas as well. Good, no, that, this is Anne again. That's great, and I'm assuming this will be part of that, you know, revision. So I don't know if we want to send things, I'm just talking logistics here, forward twice. This separately than that. Yeah, and my thought is, you know, if you're going to do it, do it comprehensively. Don't, don't do piecemeal. Um, it makes sense to kind of look at it in totality and push things forward at one time, so we're not having to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, I would say this though: if we're doing things in practice, then we need to make sure that there's a policy there. So I, I agree with Michael completely. I'm, Expediency is nice and all, but I want to make sure we're doing things the right way. Let's make sure that there's policy that governs what we do. Right. I, I completely agree. But I don't know if it's, since it's already in practice, if we need to, I'm just thinking of perhaps it moving things forward. Sorry, I know, I know we're spending a lot, I'm making a lot of comments about something that I agree with, but I'm just thinking about us looking at it comprehensively and adding this as part of the comprehensive review. Dr. Bullock, I think we all agree we're just trying to decide where's the best place to, to couch the language to, to place it. Dr. Tomlin, in light of that conversation, I'd, I'd like to hear from you about including the language as part of an overall comprehensive overhaul of the LICN-001 
versus or and or including the language in the licensure procedural manual um i have no i have no strong opinion on where it exists i agree with everyone on the call that uh, just to be clear the reason we can do this without any policy is because the national license satisfies every single requirement we have for the North Carolina requirement, or it exceeds it. So right. it, 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 it's not that we're doing things outside of policy, it's, it's that we've recognized that there is, that this, this thing does indicate all, the, all our requirements have been met exactly. So I, I don't have an opinion. I'm, I'm glad we know this now and that we're aware of this so that we can expedite those those licenses as they come in if they have a national certification um where it belongs in terms of letting the field know and letting the national association know um that we are recognizing them that i i don't have strong opinions on that we'll put it wherever the commission and the board feel it is the best place that serves the the state so uh, um, this is Tom, this is Glenda Jones again. We already do this also for our National Board Certified Teachers and speech. Is that correct? National Board Certification, yes, um, it is recognized. Those are, in fact, policy decisions because they don't carry the same requirements. Like testing requirements are not a part of that National Board Certification, or not specifically. But, and that's why we have a policy that it is something different that we are recognizing as saying is acceptable. And that is a different situation than we're talking about here. The national license in school social work is not different from our, our, our requirements. So if that were the case, if, if, psychology. oh, I'm sorry, school psychology. I, I said, I'd say social work again. Um, so if that, if, if the case were that the school psychologist license was somehow different, this would have to be in policy. Absolutely. So what I hear you saying is because it's not different, <clears throat> it really doesn't have to be in policy. It can be in the procedural manual. That is correct. But I do, I do want to recognize the benefit for, you know, of, of having, as, as Mr. Schneider said, there is benefit for having some of these things in policy that sends a very clear and strong communication to the field that this is a path that we're going, you know, that we recognize this. I also just wanted to mention, I, so I agree with Ann about the idea of a, you know, a larger overhaul of LIC and L01 and, and kind of batching a bunch of changes all at one time. But I also want us to recognize that we've made several modifications in the last year to LIC and 001. We've addressed issues as, as they've come to us, including things like the residency license and the, 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 the permit to teach. And, and I, just, I have a little bit of a problem with saying, all right, we're going to stop that now and wait and then make all these changes. I think it, as issues arise, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to address those issues and not punt them till later. Um, I, I just have a strong feeling about not pushing off issues that we can handle, see, that, that we all seem to be in agreement should happen, so. This is Freebird again. And it, it seems like we were all pretty much in agreement with it without the, the, the state school board, particularly without the 30-day uh, policy. Uh, and I think if we can begin to make ourselves competitive with those states around us, help to fill those 75 reported vacancies, help those LEAs that, that do not have, sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, help to, to fill those 13 LEAs that don't actually have full-time school psychologists. I think it, it, this speaks to the needs of the students and we can help move that process along. Uh, this is Ann again. I would say we are doing that through a procedural way. I'm just, I'm just to things in shots and maybe we do stop it at one point if we know we're close to the other again i'm in complete agreement with this as an option <laughs> I, i'd like to make a motion if i can patrick absolutely 
So I'd like to move that we strike the language from the provisional section and we move it to page six of LICN 001 and we change provisional license to continuing license under student services. And we eliminate the and we eliminate the 30 day. For the commission the entire change to the language that you're proposing. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. Do you mind reading what the revised language was? Yes, if you if you go to page six of LICN 001, section six talks about student services. Just below the three degrees, you'll see school psychology shall, shall be restricted to the sixth year and doctorate levels and school social, social work may be earned at the bachelor's level. The next sentence I suggest inserting begins with the nationally certified school psychologist credential, NCSP, issued by the National Association of School Psychologists will be accepted for a continuing professional license to the extent that such certification remains aligned with the licensure requirements for the state of North Carolina. Should the requirements change for NCSP certification, NCDPI will reevaluate to determine whether the revised NCSP will continue to be used as an eligibility requirement for the continuing professional license period. And then there will be a space inserted and then the speech language pathology licenses um, sentence will be continued there. So this is Glenda. I second that motion for just that language. So just to be clear for the commission, <clears throat> Dr. Marr, what you're proposing eliminates the 30 day uh, piece that was problematic in, in the first piece that was sent to the state board. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to uh, add the language proposed by Dr. Marr um, to page six of LICN-001. Is there any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor of approving this, please say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? Okay. We have reached agreement. Uh, I think we're done. Go ahead, Glenda. I'm sorry, I lost everybody. So I didn't hear anything after uh, the second. So you said something back to be clear, and I missed every bit of that. Could you repeat that for me? <laughs> I just asked that to be clear, we were eliminating the 30 day uh, piece that was in the first policy language that we sent to the state board. Okay. And we've already voted, and it's passed. Thank you. I vote too. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any other business. Dr. Evans, have we completed all the business for today? That is correct. Great. So thank you, commission members, advisors, and staff for your preparation for the discussions. Uh, I remind everyone that our next standing meeting will be held uh, in the state board meeting room on Thursday, November 8th from 9 to noon. We've now completed our meeting. Unless there's additional business, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Please do motion to adjourn. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Freeburn McKinney seconds. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.